Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark. We're in Nehemiah chapter 2. Going to be starting verse 9 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, verses 9 through 11 deal with Nehemiah arriving in Jerusalem. So he gets permission from the king. He makes his request to the king. And now he goes to Jerusalem. So verse 9 here, let's read it. And it says here, Then I came to the governors beyond the river. Again, remember, beyond the river means the Euphrates River. And gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Now we see that Nehemiah travels to Jerusalem, but Nehemiah is not alone. We do not know if Nehemiah requested the soldiers to go with him or if it was the king's decision. But overall, it was God's decision to protect Nehemiah on this journey. Now, when Ezra and those with him traveled to Jerusalem, Ezra was ashamed to ask the king for an escort because he had already told the king that God would protect them on their journey. You can see that in Ezra chapter 8, verse 22. God leads his children in different ways. He sends one with an escort and he sends others without an escort. So here Nehemiah goes and he travels, but he has this soldiers with him, going with him to make sure he gets down to Jerusalem. Verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard of it. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now, Sanballat, it probably is probably one of the governors to which Nehemiah showed these letters of support to the, to the governors beyond the river. Now he is called, he's called an Horonite. While some scholars believe that this refers to the city of Horanim in Moab, it probably is not the city. Otherwise, Sanballat would probably be called the Moabite. Horonite seems to refer to either the upper Bethel Horon or the lower Bethel Horon. And both of these, both the upper and the lower Bethel Horon, was located in the land of Ephraim. We see that in Joshua chapter, thir ch chapter 16, verses 3 and 5, and Joshua chapter 18 and verse 13. This would make more sense because Sanballat is believed to have been the governor in Samaria, which was only about 30 or 40 miles from upper or lower Beth Horon. So Sanballat, it's believed that Sanballat is the governor over the region of Samaria. And that he came from, he's called the Horonite because it's believed he came from one of those two places, either Beth, up, Upper Beth Horon or Lower Beth Horon. Now we come to another man named Tobiah. Now there are two things mentioned here about Tobiah. Number one, he is, he's called the servant. While most scholars believe that he was a slave that was given a high position because of his faithfulness. Yet one scholar 
thinks that this is a term of con contempt about him. Example, Tobiah, nothing more than a slave. It is not exactly clear which one is right. Was Tobiah an actual slave? Or did, did uh, Nehemiah, when he said, you know, when Senballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, ah, the servant, right? He's a servant. What, was he really uh, a slave or was he uh, just a, a term uh, a term that was used in a sense to mock Tobiah. The second thing we we read here concerning uh, Tobiah is that he's the Ammonite. Now, the name Tobiah is actually a Jewish name, and Tobiah means Yahweh is good. Was Tobiah a Jew? who was raised in Amnon in, in, in Ammon and rose to this place of power? Or was Tobiah actually an Ammonite that was given a Jewish name? Again, it is not clear which is true. We don't know if Tobiah was an actual Jew or if he was an Ammonite. Now, it seems more possible that Tobiah was a Jew, and we'll read when we see later in this letter that he has connections to the to the nobles in Jerusalem, the priest the, the priest's family. He marries, it's believed he marries a uh, a wife of a priest or or of the priestly family. So it's more possible that Tobiah was actually a Jew. Uh, who lived in Am, uh, Ammon. Now, Ammonites are the descendants of Lot's youngest daughter. The Moabites were from Lot's oldest daughter. They dwelt in the land that was northeast of Moab, on the east side of the Jordan River. And the Dead Sea. So, if you have a map and you see, you see uh, the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River goes down, and then uh, it gets to the Dead Sea. Well, on the east side of the Jordan River, that's where Moab is, and so uh, that's where Moab and Am Ammon is over there. The main god of the Ammonites was Molech. Also, his, uh, they also called Molech Milcom. Now, King Solomon married Ammonite women. And even his son, now listen to this, even his son, Rehoboam's mother, was an Ammonite. His, his son's mother wasn't, so when we say, you know, King Solomon... King Solomon, after King Solomon was his son, Rehoboam. But Rehoboam's mother, she was an Ammonite. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 31. Now it says here also in this verse that it grieved, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now, Understand this, the enemy, the enemy will never be happy when you are used by God to help encourage and to build up a Christian's life. Satan was not happy when Jesus came to seek our welfare and to die for us on the cross. There will always be opposition to even seemingly little acts of encouragement. Even, even little things, a cup of cold water, even little things like that to encourage a believer can, can be, Satan hates it. He hates it. That you seek the welfare, the benefit of another, of another brother or sister in the Lord. As you are used to help build up the walls of God's word 
in a returning backslider's life. Expect opposition. Expect hindrances, distractions, and when praying, when praying for them. Expect, expect opposition when when God uses you in the life of a of a Christian that was backslidden and they're returning to God and you're trying to encourage them and help build them up again. Expect opposition. That's just the way it's gonna be. Verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and I was there for three days. Now, Nehemiah and the troops that were with him arrived in Jerusalem and they rested now for three days. Nehemiah took these three days to consider what to do. I do not doubt that all of the way down to Jerusalem, Nehemiah was forming several different plans in his mind what he would do when he got there. I mean, he's got he's got three or four months of journeying from Shushan all the way down to Jerusalem. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time to plan. What am I going to do? Should I do this? Should I do that? And yes, no. And then at all that time, he's planning. What am I going to do when I get there? One thing he decided to do was to tell no one. Expect, uh, I'm sorry, except only a few other men. In verse, in, We see that in verse 12, what his plans were. So Nehemiah, all his journey down, he decided one thing I'm going to do when I get there is I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> I'm not telling anybody what I'm planning on doing because this is a whole new work of God. This is going to be a whole new thing. And when Nehemiah arrived at Jerusalem, he had plans in his mind and plans in his hand in verse in verse eight from the king. But he kept it quiet from the Jews who lived in Jerusalem. You know, sometimes, listen, sometimes it is better not to tell God's plans to other people because they may not believe what God is about to do and they may not receive it. Sometimes it's sometimes it's good just to keep quiet about what God is planning what God is planning to do through you. You want to start this Bible study or you want to go on the mission field or you want to move and and start a church somewhere or do something or or you want to start a children's ministry or a youth group or something. Sometimes it's good at the beginning to keep it quiet. God's moving in and be very selective as to who you tell. In 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 12, I'm going to read that. 2 Kings 21 verse 12 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evils upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. I like that verse. <laughs> Whoever hears it, their ears are going to tingle. Sometimes, listen, sometimes God's plan is so different than people's plan that they will be tempted to doubt it and to cause discouragement. But we are to carry God's plan in our heart and not share it with others until they are able to see that God is the one who's doing this work. Sometimes we have to keep it from people. They're just not going to receive it. They're not going to take it. They're going to think this is too far-fetched. Build this wall? What? It's been here for 160 years, and it's and it's and we've had the temple now, but this wall's been 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 destroyed. You mean to tell me after all these years we're going to build this wall? And, they, and there's comes doubts and fears and discouragement. No, no, no. If God is in it, keep it in your heart. Only share it with a few select people. People of faith. People that trust God. 
people that love God, that want to see, that want to see this work done. And this is what Nehemiah does all the way down. He's got plans here to do this. And, and I'm probably thinking <laughs> it is mine. He's probably thinking to himself, oh, you know what? These people, I don't know if they're going to, you know, if everybody's going to be think that this thing is going to going to happen, going to be a wonderful thing uh, or even able to be done. But if God is in it, it, it can get done. And, and sometimes people, sometimes even people of God need to see it being done before they believe it. If you know what I'm saying. Some people, some Christians, in a sense, they they don't have the faith to be to believe it at the beginning. But when they start seeing the beginnings of the workings being done, then they believe it. Then they see God's hand in it. And this is what this is what Nehemiah is doing. He's he's keeping it quiet. He's only telling a few people that he knows has faith to believe in this, that it can be done. And, and he goes down to Jerusalem and, and, and he, well, we're going to see next, next lesson in, in verse 12, we're going to see what happens, right? Until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.